The last page has been turned on my most recent read and I'm enjoying another cup of tea. Only my second of the day because sometimes you really have to, admittedly it's rather a large mug. I really have moved away from my days of drinking 10,000 cups of coffee. However, I am still adjusting to not having that much caffeine in my system. As you know, I like to talk about different genres because there are just so many books out there and the idea of sticking to only one is a bit scary. So this week I took another look at my TBR, which is still growing. I bought another two books on Thursday and picked out another recent addition to the shelves that I really just wanted to read. I have to admit it looks very similar to one that I culled from my shelves very soon after I read it last year, but that's something I will save my opinions for at the end. I have posted a couple of pictures of my reading progress with this book on Instagram, and you may have noticed them if you were watching, but if not, that may be because it's a book I started and finished relatively quickly at the end of last week. It wasn't a mindless book, which is good, but it was also not one that brought about a lot of emotion, unlike Wayward or Quite Good Actually, both of which were emotionally draining and also relatively new and absorbing reads. So join me today as we try and solve a murder with three intrepid older ladies on the Thames as we apply for membership in the Marlowe Murder Club by Robert Thorogood. So here I am, no spoilers, opinion filled and ready to roll, all of which means it's time for the latest episode of Being Bookish. I'm your host Ray, self-confessed bookworm, introvert, hermit, long-term depression sufferer and ex-coffee addict. Join me on my journey through my ever-growing to be red pile and enjoy the latest of my 100% spoiler-free book reviews. This week's is a little bit Miss Marple, a little bit Agatha Raisin, and has a hint of Death in Paradise, as it should. So light a few candles or perhaps just switch on that reading lamp because a bit of atmosphere is always a wonderful accompaniment to a reading session. Get yourself a fresh cup of something hot or a glass of something chilled, depending entirely on when you're listening and your preference, of course. And let's get started. To solve an impossible murder, you need an impossible hero. Judith Potts is 77 years old and blissfully happy. She lives on her own in a faded mansion just outside Marlow. There's no man in her life to tell her what to do or how much whiskey to drink. And to keep herself busy, she sets crosswords for the Times newspaper. One evening, while out swimming in the Thames, Judith witnesses a brutal murder. The local police don't believe her story, so she decides to investigate for herself and is soon joined in her quest by Susie, a salt-of-the-earth dog walker, and Bex, the prim and proper wife of the local vicar. Together, they are the Merlin Murder Club. When another body turns up, they realise they have a real-life serial killer on their hands, and the puzzle they set out to solve has become a trap from which they might never escape. I know that I have previously mentioned how much I like to invest in the victims when it comes to a murder mystery. How can you care about the resolution of a crime if you care nothing about the victim? However, in this case, the fact that you know little to nothing about the victim, an art gallery owner, Stephen Dunwoody, doesn't really matter. When 77-year-old crossword creator and eccentric Judith Potts witnesses a murder, she initially can't get anyone to listen, despite reporting that she's heard shouting and a single gunshot from her neighbour's house. Of course, as it seems to be in this type of book, the police dismiss her claims, sending a single officer to take a look at the house, and when they find nothing, it's written off as Judith perhaps hearing a car backfiring. Not one to leave things alone, Judith steps up her own investigation and isn't disappointed when she finds the body of her friend in the water, dead as a doornail with a bullet in his head. Most sensible people would at this point, I know I would, step away from the investigation and let the experts deal with it, but not Judith. 
Being stubborn and perhaps a little curmudgeonly, she decides to investigate further. She already has her target in mind, someone who made no bones about the fact that he really held no fondness for Stefan. The owner of a local auction house, Elliot Howard, who only a few weeks before the murder confronted Stefan at the Henley Regatta, causing something of a scene. Positive that the detective sergeant in charge of the case, Tanika Malik, has less of a chance of solving the crime than she does, Judith sets off to find out everything she can about her sole suspect, Elliot. And as is the case with every single amateur detective on their first ever case, she manages to get herself in hot water. She is very gung-ho when it comes to her theories, and nothing is going to persuade her she's wrong, even when there are alibis popping out of the woodwork left and right. Judith grows ever more curious about her friend's death when she sees the same mysterious woman walking by Stefan's house, running away when Judith calls any attention to her. What is this woman's connection to the murder? Does she have one? With suspicion in her heart when it comes to Elliot Howard, especially after there is a break-in at Stefan's house and the frame around a priceless painting is stolen, Judith sets about trying to prove that his alibi, being at church choir rehearsals, is fake. When she gets to the church, she meets the vicar's wife, Bex, whose entire life is the church, her husband and their two teenage children. Though initially not convinced, eventually she allows Judith to watch the tapes from the church security cameras so that she can see for herself that Elliot was definitely at rehearsals at the time that Stefan was murdered. But something still isn't adding up for Judith. Things seem to be going the right way until there is another murder. A taxi driver called Iqbal Kassam was killed in his home, an act that is initially believed to be suicide. He appears to have absolutely no connection with Stefan. They have no friends in common, never work together. In fact, it appears that whatever is going on, the only connection they have is the small medallion that was left on both their bodies, one saying faith and the other hope. Whatever is going on in Marlowe, Judith is now invested. She has to find out who killed her friend. And if there is any tie at all with the death of Iqbal Kassam, then she will find out who killed him too. With the help of a relatively reluctant Bex, who somehow convinced to get involved with the investigation, Judith sets about looking into anything that could possibly tie Iqbal's death with Stefan's. And in the process, the pair managed to recruit the support of Iqbal's friend and dog sitter, Susie Harris. Together, these three women appear to have very little in common, but they certainly have the same curiosity. Though Bex is more cautious than the others, Susie decidedly brash, and Judith simply a force of nature. Using a lot of trial and error and just a bit of ingenuity, the three women seem to be on the right path. Despite the fact that Elliot Howard's remains their prime suspect, another man has suddenly stepped into their line of sight, a shady solicitor who conned Iqbal out of a sizable inheritance. But there's a problem. Andy Bishop has a very strong alibi for Iqbal's murder and Stefan's. And what possible reason could he have to kill someone he doesn't know anyway? There are a number of twists and turns in the road and the threat of another promised murder hanging over their heads – but the police are no further ahead in their investigation. However, no one is more surprised than Judith and her friends when DS Malik calls them in and offers them roles as public consultants on the case. Though they may have felt as though they are constantly hitting dead ends, they are the only ones who appear to be getting anywhere. When a third body is discovered, initially the connections aren't there at all, but the medallion is found with her. Charity. It shows everyone involved that she is the final body they were expecting. And what's so more surprising, especially for Judith, is that she's the mystery woman who was lurking outside Stefan's house, only running away when she was seen. So what connection does Liz Curtis have to any of the people already involved or the two previous victims? At the moment, it doesn't appear like there is much of one at all. While trying to dig out the darkness in Elliot Howard and Andy Bishop, the three women are growing closer together, but both Susie and Bex are curious about this woman who has befriended them, as anyone would be. What secret is Judith hiding behind the locked door at the top of her stairs, and why does she get so sensitive when the topic of her long-dead husband is brought up? 
Of course, this mystery comes second to their investigation of the murders, but it doesn't stop them wanting to find out more about what has made Judith into the dogged woman she is today. Will they ever find the truth? Does she know more about murderous tendencies than she is letting on? Behind the crosswords, caftans and river swims is Judith Potts hiding a dark secret that will lead them further into danger. I have broken the cycle, though it may be temporary. This book is not a new release, despite the fact that it is far newer than many of the cosy crime books I have picked up and reviewed on this show in the past. As I am sure you have probably gathered from previous episodes, I am a massive fan of cosy crime, both in the written and filmed format. Death in Paradise is one of my favourite TV shows of all time, and if you want to know why, give my episode on the first season a listen. I will post a link in the show notes. That programme was the only reason I used to pay for a TV licence, so it felt natural to pick up this book by the show's creator. As you know, I like to provide a balanced perspective when it comes to the books I look at. And while my opinion will be what it is and nothing will change it, taking a look at reviews from both ends of the spectrum can help. So before I give you my review, what did others think of The Marlowe Murder Club by Robert Thorogood? Marina56 had a few strong words to say about this book. Luckily, they are not strong enough that I have to bleep them out for family, kindness and friendliness reasons. She gave the book just one star and said, I don't know whether the author decided to write a knockoff of the Thursday Murder Club or whether the publisher decided to take advantage of the similarities and intentionally chose a knockoff title, but in either case, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. This doesn't have the charm of the original, nor is it well plotted. I knew what the surprise twist was going to be well before the second murder, and I haven't ever watched the classic movie from which it is taken. After all, it is such a well-known classic movie, and such a well-known twist. I would have given this book two or three stars, except for the fact that the author and publisher are trying to profit from the Thursday Murder Club. Unlike the books I've looked at over the last few weeks, The Marlowe Murder Club was released in 2021, which means that there are a few more ratings and reviews to take a look through. I have to be honest, I'm a little surprised at the rating distribution when it comes to this one. It has an overall score of 3.84 with over 15,000 ratings and 2,130 reviews. 45% of the ratings and reviews give the book four stars which I also personally gave the book anyway. However, over 4,000 people rated the book as simply average. When I was looking at the negative reviews, despite the fact that less than 1% gave the book a one-star rating, those who did seemed to have similar complaints. Over the years that I've been looking at the two ends of the spectrum for book reviews, this is not something I encounter very often. It's really unusual, especially as book reviews and opinions on books in general tend to be incredibly personal. Ken enjoyed this book and gave it five stars. He doesn't seem to be comparing it to other works that have come before it, which works in its favour. He said, Delightfully cosy with a touch of eccentricity. You know you're in for something quirky when the main amateur detective is a 77-year-old woman who enjoys swimming naked in the Thames each night. It's during this nightly routine that Judith Potts hills an altercation from her neighbour's house that, oddly, the police just brush aside as a possible suicide. I'd have thought a likely murder, which is uncharacteristic for the small town, would have set the local constabulary jumping at the chance to solve it. Instead, this invigorates Judith to investigate further. She's soon joined by Bex, the vicar's wife, and Susie, a local dog walker, in an attempt to solve the case. One of the prevalent themes running through the book is Judith's role as a crossword setter for the Times. The clues are easily presented to them. It's just trying to figure out the obvious connection. Two girls, one on each knee, Roger Squires. I'm terrible when it comes to crosswords, and as Judith cites this famous example, I was none the wiser until she revealed the meaning. That brilliantly captures the whole of this mystery. I was delightfully surprised with the solution. 
It's always the seemingly unimportant clue that ends up being so vital. As always, there's lots to unpack when reading other people's reviews, and their ratings depend incredibly on multiple factors, including the type of reader they are. This is another book that I bought because someone said, I really fancy reading this, when we were wandering through Waterstones at lunch one day. Admittedly, I am able to see the physical similarities between this book and another that Marina56 mentioned in her review, and there are considerable similarities that I will be unable to avoid when it comes to my review. So there's no time like the present. Here are my thoughts on The Thursday Murder Club by Robert Thorogood. Completely spoiler-free and 100% honest. Did I like the book? Being honest, yes, I did enjoy it. I know that many have extolled the virtues of a book that this one cannot help being compared to, that of The Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman. However, I was not personally a huge fan and found that a lot of his views on the older sleuths living in his retirement village were stereotypical and rather insulting. That being said, there is no denying that the Marlowe Murder Club could be seen as profiting off the success of Osman's venture. The fact that Thorogood's lead protagonist is an elderly woman and the cover of the book shares a number of similarities, as does the title itself, could be seen as, this is just like it. But for me, that's where the similarities end. Is Judith a member of an older generation? Yes, she is, but she lives a far more active life than the characters in Osman's series. In many ways, I would say that she has a very young outlook, which makes her age that much less important when it comes to the story. She could have been 50 and the story would have been the same. One thing that definitely goes in the Marlowe Murder Club's favour is the fact that the age of the characters is pretty much irrelevant. And this is why I would probably recommend this book over the Thursday Murder Club. There is also the writing style. I've already said that I enjoy Thorogood's tropical creation in the form of Death in Paradise, and that is something that I feel personally has carried over into this novel. I get a good idea of the setting, I can see what he is talking about, and I enjoy his descriptive capabilities. The book flowed. It was a quick and enjoyable read, and I think it should be judged on its own merits rather than for the fact that the publisher, editor or someone else determined that it should have a very similar title to a bestseller that came before it. In all honesty, I think that had the title been completely different and had they not chosen red and white for the cover, the book would have sold because the story is well written and the tale itself enjoyable. Sure, there are moments when I guessed what was going to happen and I had an inkling as to the guilty party before it was revealed, but that is part and parcel of a cosy mystery as far as I'm concerned and the risk you take when you read any mystery. I liked the fact that there were hints about the potential culprit all the way through, but the motive behind it wasn't revealed until it was necessary. Do I recommend it? Yes, I think that once you ignore the title and the cover – which is admittedly not easy for everyone, you will find an interesting tale with unusual characters, none of whom have any similar qualities to Osman's, unless you count the fact that one of them is a pensioner. Will I read more by Robert Thorogood? I actually have a few of his Death in Paradise novels on my Kindle, and though I have started one, I've been pulled away from it by other more pressing books and reading deadlines. That doesn't mean that they weren't absorbing, but they weren't quite the cosy crime that I have come to expect from the show they're based on. I am going to invest in the next book in the Marlowe Murder Club series because I love Judith and Susie and Bex. However, I will wait until June when the paperback copy of Death Comes to Marlowe is released. I like my sets to match as much as they can because sometimes they are slightly different in size. Do I wish that they wouldn't go on about the Marlowe Murder Club? Yes, because I think it gives it that copycat tone which it doesn't deserve. But what do I know? I'm just a reader. If you're looking for something like this or you loved this and want something else, then you'll love these. Cozy crime is just one of those genres. Everyone has an element that they enjoy. Personally, I love the female protagonist proving her capabilities, though I will 
say that Poirot is an exception. Hence my enjoyment of the earlier novels in the Agatha Raisin series by M.C. Beaton and the Phryne Fisher stories by Kerry Greenwood. If you're looking to add some new cosy crime to your future TBR, then I would recommend you keep an eye out for Grave Expectations by Alice Bell. A psychic with her witty and sarcastic teenage spirit guide gets caught in the middle of a murder investigation when she goes to visit a haunted house. That one comes out on the 4th of May. It's fun and exciting and I loved all the characters, especially Sophie, Claire, Alex and Bash. Another book that is due to come out soon is Vera Wong's Unsolicited Advice for Murderers by Jesse Q. Satanto, due for release on the 14th of March. I would 100% recommend that you reserve your copy now. Vera is hilarious yet heartfelt and her crime-solving methodology is definitely unique and second to none. I've been off work this week and spent a fair bit of time reading through a number of books. I even started A Court of Thorns and Roses and reread Practical Magic for an episode that you will hear next week. I would have released it this week, but I felt there should be a break between the witchy tales that I have been focusing a lot of attention on of late in my reading anyway. I have managed to maintain a bit of discipline when it comes to my book buying this week, partly because I invested a fair amount of my budget on getting my hair done. By the time this episode is released, there may be a video of it on my TikTok, but possibly not. It was worth it. That said, we're not that far from March and a whole new set of releases will be available, including the exclusive edition of Clytemnestra I ordered last week. I really cannot wait to reread that as my e-arc has now expired. Truly beautiful and a book I will be talking about at a later date. So far over the last week, I have read just three and a half books. Not as many as last week, admittedly, but I have been trying to get some work done to bring my, finally bring my YouTube channel to life and have some really good episodes to look forward to over the next few months. Of course, whether I have bought a ton of books or not, it doesn't mean that I'm going to stop asking for recommendations. I am always looking for ideas for new books to add to my collection. There's nothing I love more than adding new books to my shelves, or finding new authors for that matter. So if there is anything on your TBR that you think I would love, I am not averse to getting more books, seriously. I think I've purchased around 35 this month so far definitely pass those titles on to me. You can send me an email at notbeforecoffeepodcast at gmail.com or DM me on Twitter or Instagram and I will be sure to check it out. Don't forget if you want to hear about new releases, other books I've read and keep up with my reviews, you can sign up for my newsletter on my website beingbookish.co.uk and that newsletter will be coming out soon, I promise. Oh, and if you haven't seen it yet, as I've previously mentioned, I am on TikTok. I've been adding a few unpacking videos as new books arrive. There are a few book hauls up there and some mini reviews. Me just talking about a book I've finished in 90 seconds or less. That is, the review is 90 seconds or less. I didn't finish the book in 90 seconds or less. Yeah, I know the maximum time per video is three minutes, but I think 90 seconds is enough. You can find me there at Being Bookish Reviews. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, why not share it with your friends and family and please post a star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any of the other podcatchers where you listen and you can rate it. You can follow me on Twitter at being underscore bookish and on Instagram at beingbookishpod or you can check out my website beingbookish.co.uk. Well, I've got a lot to get ready for next week and a new book is calling me. Actually, it's not a new book. I am halfway through A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J Mass. So until next time, this is me saying farewell. Farewell.